Chapter 14, page 211. Ranifer's plunge into the crevice sent him half falling, half jumping from one to another of the crude, wide spaced steps. After a moment, he missed one altogether and simply tumbled, striking his knees and wildly waving arms on every rough projection he passed. He landed at the bottom, feeling bruised, dazed, and as terrified of the inky blackness around him now as he was of the great winged thing from which he had fled. Put in a marginal note here about what he, what you think he ran away from as he fell into the crevice. What do you think he was running away from? Pause the text, pause the audio, and write your comment. Okay. He got to his feet and stumbled about blindly, hands outstretched. until he located the opening of the passage he had guessed was there. It sloped gently downward as it led away into the unknown dark. As he hesitated, eyes stretched wide in a futile effort to see something, anything. A dim glow of light shone far ahead of him. Gebu and Wenamon must have kindled a torch. That glow was its faint reflection on some distant curve of the passage wall. Ranifer fixed his gaze on it, licking his trembling lips. He could not stay here shivering and dreading. He must follow, or else climb back to the surface and be carried off to some unthinkable land of Kef by that great winged thing. He was still weighing bad against worse when the dim glow when the dim glow ahead faded and disappeared. Setting his teeth hard, Ranifer started along the passage. It sloped gently at first, then more steeply, leading ever deeper into the earth, growing blacker and still blacker until Ranifer was seized by the conviction that he was moving along a slim bridge over a vast empty space and repeatedly clutched in panic at the walls while his bare toe fearfully explored the step ahead. The floor was strewn with sharp fragments that hurt his feet. The air was hot and close and so dry it seemed to shrivel in his very flesh. So it seemed to shrivel his very flesh. It was shriveling. He was sure of it. Was it from the breath of that great black creature still after him? Or the deathly withering wind of its wings? He moved faster, scrambling blindly forward, longing for another glimpse of that light. Stop here for a second. I want you to think about what he is. His two choices are to follow that light, which he's pretty sure is Gebu and Wenamon, who whom he hates, or turn around and leave, and then have to face what scared him into the crevice in the first place. Pause the text and continue on after that. Once his head struck sharply against something hard and rough-edged, and he sank into a terrified heap, whispering prayers to the vengeful spirits and spells against them. He was too weak to run, too frightened to stay where he was, stumbling to his feet, arms locked about his head, he bumped the same hard thing again and realized it was the ceiling of the passage 
pressing so low that from here on he would have to crawl. He crawled, his teeth chattering and his whole body shaking so uncom uncontrollably that it felt as if it belonged to someone else. He had never felt so small, so alone, so outnumbered as in this terrible black place, haunted by beings he could not see or hear or feel, but only knew were there. Worse, every inch he moved forward took him nearer to an even more terrible place, the citadel of death itself. Citadel is like a fortress, the fortress of death itself. The dwelling of the outraged departed, all those who had died, one whose mere sentries or soldiers these other creatures were. Now and then he caught sight of the torch glow ahead and flung himself recklessly toward it. Though the faint, far off gleam only intensified the blackness that enclosed him, any living human, thieves and murderers included, Gebo included, would seem a friend and rescuer now. After what seemed an eternity, forever, he realized that the blackness around him was no longer entirely black. It had turned to the lesser dark of night. <laughs> Presently, it became almost grayish, so that he could see faintly the hacked-out walls on either side. Obviously, the torch had stopped moving, and he was drawing closer to the light. There was a sudden sound of chipping, followed by this noise of falling, followed by the noise of falling plaster. Ranifer halted, his desire for Gebu's companionship abruptly vanishing. I would comment here. Of course he doesn't want to be with Gebu. Now that the dark is not that bad, he realizes and remembers how terrible Gebu is. Picking up here again. Even the fear of bodiless devils gave way before the sudden, clear picture of this all-too-solid one up ahead. He's referring to Gebu. Gebu was still Gebu, human or not, and he was, at this moment, breaking through the plastered wall of a tomb. Ranifer waited until all sounds had ceased and the torch glow moved on before he cautiously crept ahead. Around a bend in the passage, he was suddenly dazzled by a patch of golden light. He flung up his hand, blinking until his eyes grew accustomed to what seemed a brilliant glare, though it was only the torchlight shining directly through an irregular hole in the wall. Even as his vision adjusted, the glare dimmed. The torch was being carried farther into the interior of the tomb. He could see now that, as he had expected, the opening ahead of him was jagged with broken plaster. He eyed it fearfully, rubbing his cold hands against his thighs. For the first time he wondered who the man had been that now lay buried here. Some great one? For the tomb was large. The torch had receded into what was apparently into what was apparently a second chamber, and the thieves' footsteps came echoing back to Ranifer eerily, as though in a vast space his flesh crawled and the little hairs prickled on the back of his neck as he edged slowly toward the hole in the wall. Shivering, he rose to his feet before it peered fearfully in and found himself staring into a pair of strange glazed eyes not two paces from his own, not two steps from his own. With a gasp, he flung himself backward, eyes tight shut against the horror that was sure to strike him dead. At the same moment, a voice growled, What was that? This is now switching back to his friend. Ancient, Hecate said in a weary voice, 
Perhaps he is not even in the, this valley. Perhaps not, said the old man in a voice even wearier. Perhaps he followed Gebu somewhere on a boat, or to the stone-cutting shop, or... Hecate sighed and did not bother to finish. It is possible, said the ancient. They were leaning against a huge boulder near a heap of rubble that spoke silently of the entrance to a tomb somewhere nearby. They had investigated a dozen such rubble heaps, prowled and searched, until they had located a few of the tomb entrances themselves, though all were well camouflaged behind rocks and piled up sand. Not one had shown a sign of having been disturbed or even visited in years and the few actual doors they had glimpsed after careful peering between the rocks had revealed the necropolis priest's seal unbroken upon the jam. So there was something put over the place where it was closed, so you would know if it were broken that they could get in, that someone had gotten in. They had located this near one, too and it too had disappointed and discouraged them. It was beginning to seem useless to keep up a search so futile in a place so vast. They had wandered far north of the rock pile from which they had seen the vulture rise. No doubt there were just as many tombs to the south of it. There were tombs all over the valley, dozens, perhaps hundreds of them. Surely, we would have caught sight of him before now if he is here, Hecate said. Unless he has... He turned to the ancient with startled eyes. Unless he has actually gone into a tomb. If he has done that, I fear it is too late for any help of ours, the ancient said grimly. Do you think he would have, ancient? Nay, surely not, the old man muttered. He moved away from the boulder and glanced around him uneasily. This valley itself is bad enough, with a keft watching from behind every rock, as like as not to see what we are up to. I do not care over much for it myself. Nor I, Hecate agreed with feeling page 215. And to enter a tomb with those two for company? That would be worse by far. I cannot believe he would do it. Come, boy, let us go back to Thebes. Perhaps we will find him waiting. Hecate nodded, but his nod carried no more conviction than did the ancient's voice. They started drearily back the way they had come, through the sand and glaring rocks, each one radiant with heat. Hecate stumbled and put both hands up to shade his eyes a little from the blinding light. Ancient, he said in a small and dismal voice, how do we know that that brother of his has not done something to him? Maybe hours ago, maybe even last night. We do not know, said the ancient. He too shaded his one eye for a moment to locate the distant cleft in the hill that marked the path back to Thebes. Then he lowered his head and hobbled on. So now in this part with his break here, we're back to Ranifer. Maybe you could comment here about your prediction about what will happen with his friend, with the ancient and Hecate. There was a silence that seemed as long as time itself to Ranifer, who lay in a tight ball, dizzy with fright, on the floor of the passage. You could put a comment here about why he's afraid, remembering back to what we last read about Ranifer. He made a huge noise, and Gebu and Wenamon heard it and I know someone's there. Then he heard Gebu's voice in the second room sounding unconcerned as ever. It was nothing, son of a jackal, son of a pig. You're afraid of your own shadow, 